Okay. Uh, welcome to this lecture in uh, when we're going to deal with industry clusters. <clears throat> and today we have uh, students from two courses in the audience uh, from this uh, transport localization economic development and uh, an addition from uh, log 715, I guess it is. Uh, and you are going to deal with a case on localization of some supplying industry for the oil and gas sector. Is that so uh, <coughs> we agreed that uh, it could be useful for you to, to attend this lecture because uh, uh, when you are establishing a uh, new type of industry or you add activity to, uh, to an existing network of, uh, of industries. Uh, we might uh, end in a situation where we can talk about development of an industry cluster. So, um, <clears throat> and, and you have also gotten this, uh, this part of the readings for this course. Uh, posted on, on Fronter for you, uh, on log 715. And uh, with the reference to the article, to one of the articles that are covered by this lecture, there are also other articles in this, uh, in this book who might be of relevance to you. We, uh, it depends on your, on your case. <coughs> So I will uh, uh, I will use a couple of hours today on on uh, on this uh, this topic. Um, the focus in in this course is on industry clusters and how transport systems can can contribute to a uh, a uh, let's say more successful development of of clusters. But to understand the uh, the nature of or the mechanisms of uh, the linkage between transport infrastructure, transport systems, and industry clusters. It's useful to to have an idea of what we actually uh, how or how we actually define an industry cluster and how how they work. Um, I will uh, go through more or less this uh, this list. <coughs> First, we'll define cluster, and then we'll see a bit on how clusters work and how the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms for for uh, for industry clusters are uh, are uh, can be can be illustrated and, un under and understood. Then I'll give some examples. <coughs> um, the main part, the, the main part of this uh, this lecture will rely upon a theory by Michael Porter, who is perhaps to you best known as uh, one who deals with value chains. But he has also done quite a lot of work on on industry clusters. In addition to that, I will also present. Um, a way of thinking about industry clusters, which are more rooted in microeconomics, uh, in trade theory, and uh, and uh, which are kind of a different angle to to the industry cluster uh, topic, different angle as uh, compared to Michael Porter. But both they are what I would say complementary theories. They are not contradicting each other, but they are. They have a nice complementarity, I think. So, when we talk about clusters, we are not just talking about a bunch of industries that are uh, located uh, together somewhere. Uh, some assumptions need to be in place, or some conditions need to be in place. Um, so they, they need to be sort of interconnected in a way. And the interconnection can be through 
interactions in the market based on uh, traditional market transactions. But it may also be in terms of integration in, uh, on, uh, on different levels, uh, cooperation, and, uh, and so on. I'll come back to that a bit, a bit later on. But we can just note that uh, they need to be in the same area. They need to be interconnected, and there needs to be a set of inter-associated um, uh, institutions. So not only the, the industry as such, but also finan uh, financial institutions like banks, research and development, university colleges, uh, the public sector in general, is a part of, uh, of, of this, uh, these types of, of industry clusters. So we have end product or service companies. <coughs> we have suppliers of, um, of uh, specialized inputs that supports uh, other companies in the cluster. We have um, producers of, uh, of complementary products products that can be uh, that, that are uh, related to each other um, we observe also firms in related and downstream industries um, that is uh, firms that supports each other in producing let's say advanced equipment as input to let's say a shipyard which is a which is an, uh, a good example from this region, or equipment for, for the oil and gas industry. And I'll show you some examples to, uh, through or towards the end of the lecture. Um, so they support these, these actors, they, they are supporting each other. And for those of you who are attending this, uh, this uh, course which this lecture is actually uh, uh, directed to, towards, uh, we can <coughs> recognize some, some um, characteristics. I just need a pointer. Because when we talk about <coughs> the, these types of uh, uh, effects where companies are working together, they compete, they, uh, they uh, may develop um, advanced production products. Then we talk about various types of external effects that takes place between them. Um, one effect is, uh, is a kind of a pecuniary effect where this type of uh, competition, production of complementary products, uh, and so on, can contribute to an increased cost efficiency. And the cost efficiency can take place, first of all, because they are perhaps more subjected to competition. Because the idea of a cluster is that it is companies that are are doing business in a related or a similar type of, uh, of, of branch or industry. So you may have a, <coughs> a set of competitors who compete on variants of the same product. In this area you have a number of uh, consultancies supporting the shipping industry. You have a number of shipyards. You have a number of suppliers of, of equipment and they compete on variants on, of the same product. So the competition is one driving factor who may, uh, may reduce the costs for all the industries in the area. 
So when a new supplier of, uh, of services to, to the oil and gas industry uh, is, uh, is planning to move to another area and establish itself there, perhaps in competition with incumbent companies. This is the type of competition that may reduce costs for the whole industry in the area. Hence, the external effects are working through the market because the prices of the products, all other things being equal, can be somewhat reduced. The other type of, uh, of effect, which we often call pecuniary external effect, is if the size of the market is affected. So if one company moves into a, an area where there are uh, related activities taking place, the size of the market may increase. So you may have a shift in demand, which also may work in the direction of increase uh, of um, decreasing the unit costs. Because if you have a, an increasing returns to scale, those of you who were at, who attended last lecture will recognize this, but for, for you who are doing this uh, case, uh, case course, we are talking about an increasing returns to scale. This is uh, unit costs cost per unit, number of units, and the costs. So as long as we have excess production capacity, the cost per unit will decrease up to a certain limit. Sooner or later, you will end uh, in a situation with the uh, pressure on capacity, and this curve will start to increase again. But what I'm talking about when I, I I say that demand matters here, is that if we introduce a demand curve, let's say that this is the demand at the outset, you will have a, <coughs> a, de a quantity demanded at a given price. And if the competition works fairly well, uh, you will have uh, a price fairly equal to an average cost of producing the product. If now <coughs> you get a, a newcomer, a new entrant into this market, um, let's say it could be a, a new company providing oil and gas services, it may be a new activity in, uh, in a given area. Uh, you may get a shift. The demand for a given set of products may increase because the size of the whole system increases. And when you have this cost structure, and the demand shifts, and you have, uh, you have always uh, the price uh, determined in the, in the, in the point where, where demand equals costs. And for uh, sake of simplicity here, I have skipped the marginal cost curve. I'm just focusing on the average cost curve because we are talking here about specialized production companies who are in a type of monopolistic competition. So in such markets, as long as you have excess production capacity, the average costs per product may go down when you increase the size of the market. You, you, you need to interrupt me if, if you just whenever you want. But this is a kind of impact. If this shift in demand results from a, an increase in the size of the industry cluster. Prices of products may, may go down. A little bit, not necessarily a very big jump in, or a decrease in prices, but it could, could matter in the longer run. 
So, um, in addition to the companies that are taking uh, place in production of, uh, of, su of supplies or, or finished goods, we have also this, these types of, uh, of uh, players in an industry cluster. The public sector <coughs> may have a quite important part, may play a quite important part in this. Uh, and I'll give you an example as we, as we move along. But to support the industries with specialized training, education and research services may also be a very important factor for supporting an, uh, a type of, of industry cluster. I mean, we are, as, as a university college, we are, we are asked almost all the time by our peers, our owners, and also by the surrounding industry to provide tailor-made training to, to support the, the, the local and regional industry. And we do that on, on many occasions. And that is also a way of increasing the efficiency of, uh, of an industry cluster or in increase the productivity of an industry cluster. Because what you do when you provide a training to people is that per, per capita, per head, each one of you who are, who are running through a, a SEDA program here will at least hopefully be more productive per man year after you have finished your, your education than, than what was the case before you started here. So when you, when you are studying the <coughs> wages, the annual wages that you can expect to get when you are, when you are finished with your study program, that is a, an, a very good indicator of um, the marginal productivity of per hour or of your uh, your uh, your efforts as an and as an employee because what the companies are willing to pay for your for your um, uh, your workforce or your uh, for a man or a, or a per hour of work should reflect the productivity that you are contributing with to your company, right? So, as you then work, you gain experience, it's highly likely that your wage level will increase. And that is on the individual level, but on the, let's say, the systemic level, if you have an industry cluster, you have a number of companies, you can change jobs, move around a bit, work in, in, in different companies, gain experience, and it's highly likely that your wages will increase. But the reason for that increase has to do with that you are more, becoming more and more productive. So it is an increase in human capital that takes place. And the return on that human capital can be approached by studying wage levels. And then it's, uh, of course, uh, from a research point of view, interesting to study the wage level in a given industry that is a part of an industry cluster and compare it to a similar, let's say, similar set of companies outside of an industry cluster. If this theory works, the networking effects, the external effects that I've talked about and the, and the human capital increase that could take place to a larger ex extent within an industry cluster should cause or create differences in the wage levels. It 
In addition to this, <coughs> there are also uh, agencies that may set standards, may define framework conditions for the cluster, uh, EU regulations is an example of that. That, for instance, uh, we are not allowed within the European Economic Agency to subsidize shipyards. That is a framework condition that we need to pay attention to. And then also all, par all <coughs> kinds of associations, trade associations, uh, and uh, collective, private, and for that sake, public sector bodies are also included <coughs> in an industry cluster. And uh, <coughs> these types of players are, in many cases, quite important. Because what, what they do in in some cases, is that they, they make people meet. And when people meet, they exchange information. And that type of information exchange, which may be in many cases informal, informal, may be very, very important to, for, for, let's say, boosting the level of knowledge in an industry cluster. And you cannot, it's not necessarily easy to identify these types of effects. But if you, if you study this over time and add small effects together, uh, it's highly likely that one might find uh, significant differences between uh, industrial clusters and more standalone uh, companies. I'll elaborate a bit more on this as we move along. So factors affecting a competitive advantage, competition, right? It's uh, the internal efficiency of a company so that we can, uh, can produce, use our real resources, human capital, equipment, and so on uh, in an efficient way. And uh, economists are, uh, <laughs> at least in, uh, in, in, in some cases, and quite a lot of cases, in, in f they think that competition is a good thing in, in trying to, to make companies more efficient. But at the same time, <coughs> very, very sharp competition could in some cases, make the situation less favorable. Because if you are in a very, very sharp competition, the rate of, let's say, the, the slack or the, or the profit that you need to undertake research and development, product development activities, is sort of competed away. So quite a lot of, uh, or, or in, in let's say modern theory of economic growth is focusing very strongly on the need for some markup. And markup is, you can translate that to profits. You need profits to be able to, to keep the research and development and, uh, and the innovation activities going. If you are in a sharp competition, that profit is competed away, and you may end in a, in a situation where, where the, the rate of innovation and, and R&D activities becomes too low, too low. Uh, <coughs> another factor is, to, is uh, some strategic choices um, where you can choose to 
to be engaged in a, in a quite, quite uh, let's say, basic industry, not very advanced production. Uh, Norway has been criticized, or not Norway as such, but specific industries in Norway have been criticized for being less sophisticated and not taking advantage of a potential which may lie in moving from a less sophisticated to a more advanced type of production. We are exporting quite a lot of raw materials. Fish, oil and gas, and so on. And many have uh, asked why don't we try to refine some of these products into more, let's say, move some steps downstream and produce more advanced products based on the raw materials. But then <coughs> we, we run into discussions on, on, uh, on economies of scale and, uh, and we run into discussions on, uh, on, on some type of comparative advantages where companies located in bigger systems in Europe, for instance, or in China, may be more, uh, let's say, it may be easier for them to, to, uh, to uh, get or to, to take advantage of the scale efficiency in production. When you are when you're located in, in, a, in an area where you have a bigger market. So, uh, <coughs> so that is one explanation as to why Norway can, or a, or a country, to be more general, can exploit their scale effects perhaps best by exporting raw materials, whereas other, let's say, companies more downstream can exploit their competitive advantages by, let's say, using cheap labor to produce uh, products further downstream. But there are, there are of course, some exceptions, and um, some of the industry clusters that we see here in this region, based on electromechanical production, shipyards, supplying industries to the, to the shipyards, are relatively small scale and very and quite highly specialized production. Some of the services that are directed towards the oil and gas industries are also quite specialized products. You need to be ne close to the end user, the customer, to be able to produce these services. So I guess that's why <coughs> This company that you are examining in log 715 is uh, considering to move further up north in, in, in Norway to be close to where the, where the activities are, are taking place. So, so we need to study the, the market, the size of the market, the, the shape of the production costs to be able to give answers as to whether you should be in this market or in this market. And then also a factor affecting the competitive advantage in an area has to do with the quality of the economic culture. And here, transport infrastructure plays a part, so that parties in the industry cluster is actually able to have this physical contact that in many cases are, are needed, is needed. The public governance, <coughs> including research and development programs directed to, towards, this, uh, towards the industry in, in, uh, in question, that they have a support um, also with, with respect to, to maintenance of the labor force, if you like, health care and uh, education and everything that goes with it. And then the industry culture and tradition in the area. As many of you know, perhaps, um, and I, I 
I all, all the time I use this region as an example because it's uh, it's a good example actually also in uh, in in a, in, a, in a global perspective I would say uh, <clears throat> because if you have a culture and that is what Porter is it's more he's he's more on this cultural thing than the microeconomists that I will uh, I will show you the difference uh, a bit later on. But Porter is very much focused on the culture and traditions. And this can perhaps a bit easier be seen when we when we study this uh, this uh, diamond model, which is uh, which is quite quite well known. I think it was developed in the, in the end of the 1990s. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, um, a set of main components in a model that can be said to explain why uh, industry clusters can be, uh, become uh, more productive and, and successful. And let us start here with the demand conditions. Because, uh, and this is a, what is listed here is, what are listed here is a points that can represent conditions that can give a, uh, an, an industry cluster uh, a, a kind of a competitive advantage over other, let's say, competitors world worldwide, if you like. Sophisticated and demanding local customers. That means that you have a set of customers that are competent and who are able to initiate uh, product development activities. So that they are actually not only off-the-shelf buyers of standardized products, but they are actually, they may be subjected to severe competition in their markets, like the ship owners are, and they are, uh, they are qualified enough to see, let's say, potentials for development. So when, when companies says that customers are our biggest asset, that is not only talk, it has a substance, in, at least in some industries, where the customers are taking active part in the product development process, which is the case in this local electromechanical industry cluster. So then the ship owner can, uh, can, uh, can call a, uh, let's say, an engineering company or a, or a consultant uh, and discuss how can this problem be solved. And then you have a chain of events which may in turn result in a, uh, a product development activity which can give this, uh, this, this local set of industry a uh, a competitive advantage. This one is very interesting because you can imagine that this local demand it's linked linked with this one. Let's say the the, the market for uh, for supply vessels in the oil and gas industry where the local or national oil companies can demand special uh, vessels for to handle uh, bad weather or uh, to be able to stay in pot position uh, no matter how rough the weather is. They may demand specialized lifting equipment that can take equipment from the ship and up to the platform, even if, the, if you have rough seas. And let's say, let's say that you have 
customers that, that can contribute to, the, to a product development process. And at the same time, these products are demanded from, uh, from let's say, Brazil or other parts of the world. Then this, development process, uh, this product development process is not only addressing a local market, but it is actually addressing, at best, a large global market. And hence, these local customers can, can cause something to happen that can boost the global sales of the same product. which is uh, also linked to this one. I mean, if you, if you use all this knowledge to develop three vessels to serve the local market, it's not a big potential for, for anything, perhaps. But if you, if you can sell the same vessels worldwide, it's uh, obviously a good thing. And that is actually, if you, if you study these local industry clusters, you can find this, this type of pattern rather easily. Then you have this one, <coughs> related and supporting industries, where, uh, where uh, you have the supplier industry, then you are moving upstream in the supply chain. And, and you engage uh, uh, the suppliers, and they are uh, they are in in a, in a network. They're maybe they're in a cluster. It should be more than one supplier. It should be some that can compete and to develop solutions that may not be identical, but comparable. So this is, uh, this is also an important uh, issue when we talk about clusters. And then you have <coughs> the, the factor conditions. Then we, then we talk about uh, capital, availability of capital, the availability of human capital, not only monetary capital, but also human capital, as we have talked about. But many <laughs> or not many, but in some uh, articles, there are some focus on the banking industry, banks, the financing institutions, whether they are presented and owned locally, or whether they are centralized institutions with a head office and in Oslo or New York or London or wherever, Shanghai. And the difference in the way they, these financial institutions assess risk. Because if you, if you are, let's say, if you have the head office and the decision makers are located way out of the region, they may not have the necessary understanding of how an industry cluster works. They may actually, uh, as a result of that, perhaps become, perhaps they become more risk adverse, as compared to a local bank who sort of understand this, uh, how this works, and and can uh, can be more willing to take risks. As one example. This <coughs> is the context, the local context, the culture. Um, competition about, uh, among locally based rivals. 